Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Article 7 of question 46 of the Prima Secunda of the Summa Theologiae of Thomas Aquinas is raising a very important question about anger on the one hand and justice and injustice on the other. And it's translated in the Black Friar uh, edition as our anger and justice concerned with the same object, which technically speaking, I, I suppose you could say is correct. A more literal translation of utrum ira sit ad illo solum ad quos es justitia would be whether anger is against those things or those people uh, ad illos uh, only to which justice pertains. And so, you know, it does have this sense of being directed at the same objects, like intending the same targets, you could say. Um, but it, it's not exactly the same, and we should be careful given that anger has the object of revenge, and there's other ways of using the term object. Now, this is an interesting article in that there are three really substantive arguments given for why anger and justice would maybe overlap to some extent in what they're directed towards, but not completely coincide. And they have to do with things that previous writers had remarked on about anger. So the first one starts out by saying, justice is not possible between a human being and things that are lacking reason, ad res irrationales, a devoid of reason is another way of talking about it. And Thomas, you know, in this argument says, well, you know, sometimes people get angry at non-rational things. He gives a couple examples. A writer will throw down his pen. Perhaps he's actually talking from experience there as a writer. A rider will beat their horse. And so we've got, you know, inanimate objects that we get angry at. We have animals that one could get angry at. We could substitute another thing in there, maybe plants, you know, that are living but not sentient, right? All of these are irrational things. And so he goes on and he says that, um, therefore, anger doesn't have only as a target those towards whom justice is possible. Justice is only possible towards rational beings. We get angry at all sorts of beings. So the scope of anger would be wider than that of justice and would include the things that, that justice is directed to. So that's the first argument. The second argument uh, says that there is no justice between a human being and themselves or between a human being and their own property, according to Aristotle in the Nicomachean Ethics. This is in uh, book five, of course, where there's this famous discussion of whether you can do injustice to yourself. And so in a strict sense, you can't, right? You can only do it injustice to another person. And he's already talked about his own property. So he's not going to worry about that because your own property would be uh, things that are lacking reason. What about yourself? Can you be angry at yourself? Can you have injustice towards yourself? And he says, so you, you can't have injustice to yourself or justice, but you can get angry with yourself. People do this all the time. And he brings up uh, a repentant sinner. And then he brings up... Um, a 
psalm that I don't think really proves this case. Be you angry and sin not. Irascamini et nolite pecare, right? Um, but he's drawing from this the conclusion anger is not restricted to those with whom a relationship in justice is possible. So in the first one, it was you can't be just or unjust to inanimate things. You can get angry at them. We do all the time. In the second, um, you can get angry at yourself, but you can't be just to yourself. So once again, uh, anger has got a wider scope than justice. What about the third one? This is a, a very interesting one. And again, he's going to invoke Aristotle. Aristotle makes this important distinction between anger on the one hand and hatred. And Aristotle claims that hatred is against classes of people. You, you, can, be, you can hate an individual, but you hate them as a member of a class. So you hate them as a thief or as an adulterer or as a despised group that you can't stand or something like that. If you have you know, prejudice against a group. Anger, Aristotle says, is always against individuals. It could be against multiple individuals, but it's not against a class, uh, a generis, right? Or a community, communitas. And so he says that um, the state can wrong an individual, but you, you cannot become angry at a entire class, a genus, only at a single individual. So one who is not angered properly at those who are objects of justice and injustice. The state can do wrong to you, but you can't, you can't be angry at the state. You can hate the state, but you can't actually be angry at it. Or a group of people could bully you and you could get angry at them individually, but you can't get angry at the entire group. The group is what's doing the injustice to you. And so, um, this is the argument that's being made. And he says, um, on the contrary, we have the position of Aristotle. Okay, so uh, he's going to use some Aristotelian stuff uh, against this in the, the responses to these objections. But the reply is very interesting. He says, anger actually desires evil, as we've said above, right? Uh, malum, insofar, in quantum, as it has the aspect of just revenge. In quantum habet rationem, the, the reason or the aspect, justi vindicata vi, right? So that is saying that um, anger, it's desiring evil insofar as this has the aspect of just revenge. So what does this mean? Anger is directed against those towards whom there is the possibility of justice or injustice. How is this fleshed out? He says, um, inflicting punishment is a matter of justice, right? And it, you could be mistaken about whether it's just or unjust, right? But the idea behind inflicting punishment is to impose um, justice. Injuring someone is an injustice, right? So he says, in virtue of its cause, the endurance of injury at the hands of another and of the revenge of the angered person desires, it is clear, manifestum est, that anger is concerned with the same people, so ad quos, as justice and injustice. So if that's really the case, then what's up with these arguments that were being made, uh, including arguments that are being drawn from Aristotle? So the response to the first argument is going to make a, a useful distinction. It's going to say, listen, animals get angry, right? And um, he says that although it's responsive to reason, anger may be found in brute animals, irrational animals. That's all the other animals except for us, uh, which lack reason, but they are capable uh, by a natural instinct, right? So instinct can drive them. He says, um, uh, in quantum naturali instinctu. And then he says something really interesting. Per imagiationem moventur. Now, when we hear that term imaginationum, that's imagination that can be translated as it is 
here in the Blackfriar as sense knowledge, but that's not really the most accurate translation. Animals have a capacity for imagination, for inference, for um, you know, drawing on these instincts. And he says that this works for the animal kind of like reason. It, it stands in the place of reason. Um, the Latin here, ad aliquid simile, right? So according to some kind of likeness, uh, operibus rationis, right? It, it does its works in a, in a seemingly rational way, but it's not really rational, right? We humans are animals. So we also have instinct, although our instincts are pretty weak, but we have imagination, right? We have imagination and reason, and we can get angry because of both of these. So he says, because we have these powers, we can be aroused to anger in two ways. First, when an injury is perceived um, just through the imagination, so, I mean, this could be sense perception, right? It could also be us imagining that things are happening that aren't actually happening. And so he says, on this basis, you can be angered even by irrational and inanimate objects. So, you know, other animals, your pen, the door, the wind, whatever it happens to be. He says, thus an animal reacts against anything injurious because it, it perceives it as if it's doing something bad to it, right? And then we have the anger that can actually arise from reason, the working of reason, or at least with reason. He says, reason may be conscious of an injury in this respect. As Aristotle says, there can be no anger towards insensible objects or towards the dead. And for two reasons, they feel no pain. And those who are angry want their assailants to suffer. And in their regard, revenge is out of the question because they can't be punished. So... In, in when it comes to re reason leading to anger, then we, we can't actually have anger against irrational things, only things that we can have justice or injustice in relation to. When it comes to our sort of animal imagination and this sort of thing is just triggering us and we get angry like a dog gets angry when you pull its tail or you, know, you make a face at it and it growls at you or something like that, well, then that could be towards things that we don't have justice or injustice to, like our book, you know, the, oh, look, the cover opened up. Oh, I don't like that. I'm angry at it or something like that. So that, that's a prime example right there of what he's talking about. But notice that you could say that with imagination, in a certain respect, we're kind of imagining that that thing, that inanimate thing, is doing wrong to us. I can't believe that book page came out. I don't like that. It did something wrong to me. Now, that, that's crazy talk, right? But that's the way our brains work sometimes. So that, that's one possible way of understanding it. The second argument, there's no justice between a person and themselves. So, that, you know, you can't... Um, say that anger and justice have the same scope because we do get angry at ourselves. Thomas is going to take a kind of funny way of resolving this. He says that Aristotle recognizes a kind of metaphorical or, you know, we could say analogous justice and injustice between a person and themselves in that the rational control of the contending and impulse appetites. These are parts that are like working with each other. So because your, your soul or your psyche or personality uh, has different parts, you can talk about them existing in a state of justice or injustice with each other. And then he says, in this sense, we speak of a person punishing themselves and consequently of them becoming angry with themselves. Now, this is interesting. So punishing themselves we could say maybe the rational part punishes the non-rational parts, but becoming angry with yourself, that would must be the contending or irascible appetite, getting angry with the rational part or with you know, the concupiscible part. Um, so that's you know, an interesting thing. But he says, 
properly speaking, proprie et per se, it doesn't happen that a human being actually becomes angry with himself. Non contingit aliquem, so it doesn't happen that a person, somebody, sibi ipsi irasci, becomes angry with their very own self. That doesn't seem to be a satisfactory resolution, but that's, that's what Thomas says here. Then the third one, which remember, the third argument was just, justice and injustice can be between individuals. It can involve uh, classes, you know, a genus. It can involve a community to an individual. So anger can't be directed against classes or communities only against individuals. So therefore, justice and anger would have a different scope to them. So Thomas actually says here that um, anger is provoked by an injury suffered through somebody's action. Since all actions are done by individuals, anger is always directed against an individual. Okay, so this doesn't sound good so far. But then he says, if an entire community... Uh, injured us, we would reckon it as an individual. Computantur sicut unum singulare. And this actually does make sense. This is how people perceive things. Don't they get angry at the government? When really it's somebody, uh, you know, in some sort of functionary clerk role who pisses them off or uh, somebody else who happens to be a manager. They don't represent the whole government, right? Or the, the entire state, but they do get angry at that. I'm angry at the university. Well, that's a university is just an assemblage of people. I'm angry at the army. We're treating it as if it is a single individual. And in that case, well, you can actually get angry at a group or at a community. You're just doing so as if it was a single individual, which would mean then that anger would have the same scope or same application to people and things as does justice and injustice. So he's making a strong case here for Anger, at least in some senses, not, ne not necessarily the mere animal sense, but the rational sense, to have <clears throat> a similar scope to justice in us.